Well, hello and welcome uh, back to another Microvelm live event. My name is Clay and we are glad that you're joining us here today. We are streaming streaming once again from our Southern Oregon headquarters here on the 20th day here of uh, December. In case this is the first time that you have joined us for this live event or for these live events, we host these free educational sessions weekly for our users and for those who are curious about our solutions as well as uh, other tools or associations that complement our products and uh, for the woodworking industry. And our goal is to provide a platform for education, and we appreciate you taking the time to join us today. Uh, we're streaming on two platforms today for your convenience. We're here on the Zoom platform as well as our YouTube live stream. You can ask a question at any time on either of these platforms. You can simply sit, click that uh, green Q&A button on the Zoom navigation if you want, or even uh, use the comments area. We're monitoring both areas, uh, as well as the comment area there on YouTube. And we are also recording this event and it will be available on our website within the next couple of days as well as our help center well this week we decided to switch things up a little bit we host these live events every week here in the u.s um, but we really haven't dedicated much time for the australian and new zealand time zones and um, as well as the content and we're looking forward to changing that in the new year so we're happy to have this first of many more live events uh, in this time zone so good morning to all of those of uh, of you who are watching here in uh, Australia and New Zealand. Since this may be the first time that you have tuned into one of these events, I just want to make sure that you understand uh, where you can access these recordings because we've been doing these events since June and uh, we've got a lot of good information that we've posted up on our website as well as our uh, YouTube site as well. So if you log into our, our help center at support.microvelm.com, you can find the live event recordings area under the webcast category. and. Like I said, we started these events back in June and we've accumulated quite a bit of content there. If you don't have access to that help center, you can also find these recordings on our YouTube site as well as um, on our website, microbellum.com. All right, with that out of the way, let's get down to what you came here to see today uh, to help us out with a review of the uh, latest Australian, New Zealand uh, product library. We've invited Matt Davies to help us out today and he's joined by Tim Veal and a number of our other techs helping out behind the scenes today. So thanks again for joining us today, Matt. Yeah, thanks Clay. Um, thanks for having us and it's uh, looking forward to doing more of these um, as we go throughout the next year. So we're planning on hopefully doing one a month in Australia um, as well as the, the US based um, ones that we've already been doing. So today I just wanted to go through um, some of our new things and features that we put into the latest library. Um, so we've built a new 17.3 library um, about two weeks ago now um, that it's ready for rollout. So um, I'm just going to go and jump in and just show you some of the new features along the way. I'm also going to be demonstrating some of the new 15.5 um, build um, related differences between uh, things um, that user interface more than anything along the way as well. So if you're not familiar with that and you haven't watched any of the US um, live events that have been showcasing that, we're just going to go over that um, probably in a little less detail than they would have in the US, but um, albeit it'll um, hopefully give you a bit of an idea of what 15.5 has to offer. So I'm just going to start a new project here. I'm just going to call this um, live one and just jump straight into it. So one of the um, biggest changes with 15.5 is the specification groups and how we set and configure spec groups. So when you jump into it, you'll probably notice that it looks a lot different to when it did before. It, what we've done is made it a lot more simple to navigate, a lot easier to jump into, say, the global. So you can see here I'm clicked on my color board specification group there. Each one that I click on will tick the box. Up the top is our global files, our wizards, our material files. So as we click on those, it just takes us straight in. We don't have to right click and say show global variables anymore. We can just jump straight in, which is really nice. The other great feature about this is that now we've got the ability to import a specification group from another project. So if you've set up a project that has um, you know, multiple configurations in it that you've, you need and you want to have you know, some global changes, um, things like that, you can just jump in, select the project that you, you were working on and select which spec group you, that you want to import into the new project, which is really nice. Um, so to change any of your materials now, so you can see here that in our color board spec group, we have the global variables, we have the, the material file here, the edge banding record, the hardware record and the door wizard. 
So um, by any of these, over on the right hand side, um, we have our cut parts record. So I've got three in there. I've got MV standard paint and wood grain. So if I wanted to perhaps make uh, color board um, paint, I'll just go to line them up and click them across. It's that simple. Um, so it's, it's a lot more user friendly. It's a lot easier. It's a lot easier to copy spec groups as well. So for example, if I wanted to copy this wood grain specification group, I can copy that and here it asks me, do I want to create a new global variable record for this or do I just want the cut parts file and the edge banding file to be different and I can name those as well. So I could call it, you know, whatever I want it to be. So it takes a copy of the wood grain and then it gives it a new name. So I could say either just give it automatically call it wood grain two or it might be a material that you want to call it um, like a, a, you know, oak or something like that. Um, so the good thing about that is it's fast. So we can quickly set and take a copy of the global in a project. So now I have um, in here, I have two globals for this project. So I might have a global in there that has a different kick height, for example. Um, so if I'm clicked on here, I can go into the global for that one, change the kick height to, uh, let's say, change the kick height in this one to 100. And now I've got a, a global variable in that project with 100 and I've also got one with uh, 200, everything else is the same at this stage. And I could have kept those material files exactly the same as well. I didn't need to copy those. So it, really easy to set up, um, really nice. We love love using it. It's it's much easier to train new, new staff on, on this as well. So that's all I'm gonna go into on the specification groups. I'm happy that my spec groups are set up. I'm not gonna change too much on the materials. Um, and I'm just gonna get in here and just start a project. So I'm gonna create a room. Just using my standard template here. Now, one thing in the new library is the walls. So we've now got some new ability um, once we draw walls. If I um, just draw some walls here. So five meters. Once you've drawn your walls there, um, we can come in and we can go to the prompts of these walls now. You'll notice we've got some ceiling conditions. So we can say we've got a flat ceiling or it's parallel to the ridge. So it might be parallel to the ridge and then you can have your height difference to the ridge. So if the ridge, you've done a site measure and the ridge is inside the ceiling is 1200 mil higher than the top of the wall, then you type 1200 and then the distance to the center of the ridge from the face of the wall. So it might be 2400, uh, 2400 in here. If I refresh that, you'll see that now the angle will automatically change to 26 degrees. Um, I can also put obstructions. I could add bulkheads um, to that and I can also add columns. So I've got a lot more functionality with, with that by be, you know, being able to add a bulkhead or a column directly to the wall. Um, if it's not going to be cut on the machine, there's no, no need to, to machine it. So you can just have it drawing on the actual wall itself. So now you can see here I've got a bulkhead as well as I've got a now a tapered um, ceiling there. So if I change that to being perpendicular to the ridge and I'll take my um, bulkhead out, um, you'll now see I can control the position of the ridge. So it's from the left hand side, how far it is to the center of the ridge and how high it is to the ridge. So that's nice. Um, having that ability now, we can thank the US developers for that because we, um, we took that out of their library, which is um, really handy. So now I'm just gonna draw some products and show you some other cool features that we've got. Um, I'm just gonna start with a, um, a tool cabinet here. So I'll come down to my um, tool cabinets category and grab a one door tool. Just gonna place it on the wall. So I'm just gonna put a 30 mil filler in there. With the new 15.5 build now, you'll notice that in the prompts page, we've got red um, numbers here. If it's red, it's a formula. And the great thing is now that we can just right click and show the formula. So I can see that the height equals my global tool cabinet height. And I can just add to that formula. Or I could just completely overwrite it by hard, you know, typing a hard value, but I might say minus 100 um, or plus 200 or whatever I need to put in there. Um, so I can, that's, that's really a nice feature. And it's good to see what's making up the formulas behind the scenes. Um, so that's one thing we can do. Now, the other thing we can do, if I add the fillers here, you'll notice, and I've got a, say a, a filler style three and a left-hand filler, I'll make the filler 30 mil wide. 
You'll notice in our construction options we've built in, and forgive me, I've got 1.5 millimetre reveal override set. It's probably most of you guys would be using two mil gap, so you'd have that set as one. But now we're driving those reveals to be automatic when you're adding fillers and end panels to cabinets. Um, so that's nice. It's automatically put a left, a three mil left hand reveal on there. I can also override it, but it's just trying to improve the speed and efficiency for you guys using the software on a day-to-day -day basis and and having to change less things. So um, that's one thing we've done. The other thing, if you haven't got the latest libraries, like uh, anything from 16.3 on, we've now put notches into a lot of the cabinets so we can control the width and the, um, whether it's a left notch here, I've got a left notch and the size of the notch, 200 by 200. Um, so that's a nice, um, nice thing to be able to do in every cabinet. So I've got that there, I've got the notch into that unit with all of the, the new uh, parts going on that's needed with the new backs and the new side there. Um, the other thing that we've done is we've got the ability for the flat shot tokens and you may have seen these on some of the US um, live events if you've done them and we just haven't had time um, in Australia to put it into our library until now. So now what we can do, you've probably seen this button, it's called draw dynamic product image. When I select that and select the cabinet, over to the right, I'm just going to place that down. And what it's going to do, it's going to draw a flat shot of the plan view, front elevation, side uh, section, a southwest isometric and an exploded view. So you can see that, that there. So this is really nice if you're doing custom cabinets because Previously, if we were putting reports out um, onto the floor, that your, your report would just show what the cabinet was. You might have started with a one door base cabinet, you've turned it into some crazy you know, counter. Um, previously, that would still just show the one door base in the reports. Now, all our reports are going to show you this, whether you've put it onto the screen in the drawing or not, it'll automatically put that onto reports, which I'll show you shortly. But that's just really nice to be able to do that fast and, and get some information down onto the floor if, if you've done a non-standard cabinet, say like this one with the cutout, so you can see what's going on there um, into your plan view. So I'll get to the uh, reports in a little while. I'm just going to show you now we've also got a new sync configurator um, in our products. So with our sync cabinets, we've been requested this for a long time, um, being able to draw any size sync. So I'm just going to pop a, I'm just going to put it out to the side here, a standard cabinet. Now, a um, couple of things we've done to the sink cabinet. We've added the um, dishwasher plumbing access to the left and the right. Um, and within that, we've got our plumbing cutout options where we can make that a round cutout, position the cutout from the left and the right, or make it a square cutout. Um, so that's, that's nice in, in the sink cabinets, which is pretty common. It's the sort of thing that we usually train on site, but um, we've now included it in the library, so um, it doesn't have to be done. Now here I can, I've got my add sync um, is ticked. So in my um, construction, oh, my benchtop variables here, I've got my sync type. So if we now select the sync configurator, we can still go to all of our old um, systems that we had before, but now we've got the sync configurator. Now I'm just gonna let this draw without um, going into the sub-assembly from here. I could right click and go in and access that sub-assembly and make adjustments now, but I'm just going to let it draw so we can see what it's doing here. So I've got now a sync configurator that we can use as a sub-assembly. So by using the sub-assembly prompts button here, I can select that sync sub-assembly and here I can change, say, so make it 800 wide. Um, the overall sink depth, overall sink height, whether it's an undermount or a drop-in sink, and how many bowls I've got. So we can go up to four bowls, I'll just leave it on two. Um, with the bowls, it's actually handled by a calculator. So if I wanted to come in and say, you know, you've, you've got the Mercer catalog or the whoever sink you're using, Oliveri catalog out, and you can say, okay, well, the first bowl's 400 and the other one's the balance of that. You calculate it and it'll make a, a twin bowl. Um, with the cutout, we can we can um, choose to include the cutout. We can match the corner to the sink shape, or we can make a rectangular cutout. And here we can also set a, a cutout gap. So that's the overhang basically from the um, from the, the sink itself. So I'll let that draw, and you'll see what's going on here. 
So that's a new little feature we've added, um, which is nice. Um, we will be doing more of those um, during the year and um, next year we'll be putting out a brand new uh, library um, with, um, towards the end of the, the year. We hope to have it ready for the end of the year. It'll probably be ready for, the, uh, for January 2019, but we're going to do a complete rebuild of the library from scratch. So get rid of what we've got now and start again. So anybody that's on the panel, feel free to email myself or Tim. Um, any suggestions that you've got for, for the new library, anything that you see that we haven't got. Um, but we will be putting everything that we've got here back in, but we'll be simplifying the library a lot and making it a lot more user friendly as far as sub-assembly inserts go. Um, and you can understand this library, if you've been using microvellum a long time, has been around since like um, probably 2002. It was first started and we've sort of dragged it through from there. So a lot of people have worked on it and a lot of the formulas have um, been overcomplicated. Um, and the other thing you'll probably would have noticed if you're in machine tokens with microvellum that uh, previously we could only ever have nine machine tokens per part. Um, so that limited us to how we had to, to build and machining tokens into the into the cabinets, which made it complicated to understand what was going on. So if you would switch from a cam to a, construct, a screw construction method, it would be one token that was driving that. So in the new one, we're unlimited as to how many machine tokens we have. So we'll be having individual machine tokens for each process. So you'll understand and be easy just to see exactly which ones are turned on at that time and go in and make any changes without having to read a, a formula that's a page long. Um, so that's going to be uh, really nice. What I'm going to do now, I'm just going to process these so you can see um, the changes. And also before I do that, I'll just jump into this cabinet and I'll, I'll just take the notch out of it. Um, so you'll see when I do that, that the dynamic um, flat shots are actually, they are dynamic, they're live. So as I make changes, it will, as it's doing now, update the live, inf the live dynamic information. So now you can see now that, that if I look down from the top here, now that notch is gone. So as you're working on your cabinets and as you make changes or add parts, if I add shelves in there, it's going to be live and it'll, it'll, it'll show those additional changes, which is really nice. It's great for that time when you're doing custom stuff to the, to the factory floor and you just need to give those, the boys a little bit more information um, for assembly. Um, or how it's meant to go together. Now it's it's a click of a button. It's about 10 seconds for it to build, and and you're done. You don't have to, you know, do a plan section elevation and give them a whole bunch of details. And you can still come in here and put your own tags and and labelling on that if you need to. So I'm just going to process um, this these couple of cabinets through so you can see what happens um, when we do that. As far as the the new reports that we've got. Now, I'm not sure if everybody's aware of this now, but you've got this button here called flat, uh, process flat shot token. So if that's selected, it will automatically do this. If it's not selected, it's not going to produce the reports that we need. Um, the other thing with the work order name, um, work order naming is, is fairly important, um, especially if you've got a lot of work orders going out and having these um, automated um, ways that we can get that information straight on onto that work order instead of having to individually name them um, is really cool. So we've got things like project name, you can have room name, um, you can have date, you can have um, the architect, you can have the, the general contact on that. So you can build a lot of information just by clicking on these and adding the variable and it just keeps adding that to the string. So, and you can put a space there if you want um, and it'll, it'll put a space between it or an underscore. Um, between it so you can you know, see it clearly. But this is automated. So as you do more work orders, it will override the existing one that's in there. Um, so that's cool. And you can also just set a live uh, a uh, custom name here if you want. So I'm just going to create that work order. So with the flat shot tokens, um, we don't have to, you'll see that now with, if I come to my reports, I have my um, uh, product detail style two report here. Now I've got all for this first cabinet, all the parts list. And then the second page is going to be the plan view elevation, side elevation and 
the isometric. And then we've got the same for the sink cabinet there. Okay, so that sink's looking a bit funky on that. We might have to work on that, but that's the sub assembly coming through. Because uh, that sink is actually made up of parts. Uh, that's probably why it's, um, it's doing that. So it's just a, a bunch of parts that have no material selected or it's just got a negative material. So that's, that's nice. And we've also got a um, product detail report style three. So these would be the ones that you just, you're typically only going to need to print the page that the cabinets aren't standard. Um, so if you've got uh, an exploded view, we can change that to just be the isometric if you like. Um, it's pretty simple. So there's some um, new reports that we've got um, in there. Basically, we've gone through all of the reports and simplified them, made, a, made them quite a bit cleaner. Um, the material cost ring report, um, pretty similar, but yeah, we've cleaned it up, cleaned it up a bit. Um, now the other thing, once we've nested, just going to um, select the all those parts, and I'm going to send it to my processing station now. Just in case you haven't been familiar and know the difference between the old tool file structure and having a processing station, the processing stations are really, really handy. Like I've just got one nester here, but that nester could be called um, my block nesting. And then I might have one set up for stay down nesting. I might have one for true shape nesting if you have that as an option. Um, we can set up a, uh, you might have one set up for doing mitered panels so that it sets the gap between parts further. So each one of those will share the tool file, but it'll have its own unique rules for the nesting and for the settings, okay? So it doesn't touch the tool file. You don't have to have multiple tool files and like we used to, we'd have to maintain, you know, three tool files if you wanted one with different gaps and one that had a um, double passing always on, um, for example. So you might have one that's set up there for single passing and you might want to have one that's set up for double passing. Um, so this is really handy for that. So we've got some new small part handling um, rules as well. So we can have double pass, always double passing. Um, so if I untick that, it will then um, use the rules for my small part threshold being 240 millimetres in the length of the width and an area of 55,760 square millimetres. So that's a fairly small part. So um, it will double pass anything that's smaller than that. Um, typically, you'd have that set a little larger, say at 120,000 square millimetres. Um, so it was four by five or something like that. Um, the other thing we've got if you is tabbing. We can now tab on our nesting. Um, if you have the new integrated post processes, um, you can run tabbing. So your and it will again look at your small part threshold and tab anything underneath that. So it'll leave say one millimeter by 30. So you can see what's going to do there, and 30 millimeters long, and the tab length of of 10 for the tab length too. So that's pretty handy. We've had a, quite a few companies requesting that. So that's in there now. Um, unfortunately, it doesn't work on your standard tool files. You would have to have the new integrated post processing tool files. And the difference with those is that um, it doesn't use a spreadsheet to, um, to calculate and crunch all, the, all your G coding. It's actually using the software. So it's quite a bit faster for processing, um, sometimes up to um, up to 10 times faster depending on what, what you're doing. And we've had times where it's actually even faster than that again. So uh, it might be something worth considering, um, but it is it is available. Um, anybody with auto labeling machines um, will have access to that automatically um, as part of that, as part of their package. And that's how they, that's the only way they work now. The new auto labeling machines only work with the integrated post processor. And that's why some of you with auto labeling machines have been held back from upgrading to 15.5 uh, while we get those um, all up and live. So, so far we've done um, BSE, Anderson and Wootrons. Um, we're just about to start the wikis and the SEMs and pretty much then that's all of our customers ready to go with auto labeling with the new integrated post processor, which will be really nice. Um, the other thing I want to go through once we've um, processed that, and I'm not sure if I did process it. No, I didn't. I'll just process that out. The way that we handle moving nested parts and uh, doing machining has changed quite a bit. 
So I'll just come into my whiteboard here, open up my composite nest drawing. So I've got all those parts on the screen there. Previously, we had a drop down where you'd say, you know, I want to move an nested part, I want to rotate an nested part. It was fairly hard. You had to click on the right spot and move across your mouse at the right speed to, to grab that drop down. We now have this button here called the Nest Editing and 2D Machining Tools. By selecting that, it'll dock a toolbox off to the right hand side, very similar to your 2D part machining tools. It, it is pretty much the same. Um, the same dock. The only difference is that when we've on the nesting, we've got the nest tools here. So we can um, even just draw a sheet down into your, your, your drawing now, like you could in 6.7. But, but now if I scroll down on the right hand side, we've got this scroll down button, depending on the screen resolution that you're running, you may not need to do that. Um, here I've got my move nested part, so I can move a nested part, say this part here, and move it over to the sheet over there from there to there. It'll move that. I've got the copy nested part. I've got the erase nested part. I can change my set mill. So if we don't need to change the set mill on this part, I want it there and on this part, I want it over here. Um, we can do that from here. We can also update the existing G code um, from here once you've made those changes. Um, and we can um, show the machining process by clicking on that. I won't show that because it goes through the whole process, um, but that'll just show you which way it's going to route based on what we've got on the screen. Um, and I can also assign priorities to the borders and assign priorities to routes as we could in the old drop down. So nothing's really changed. There's no more functionality really in this. It's just a much nicer user interface and everything's there on the screen for you. Um, you still got all your part tools, or your part tools is more for if you just want to drop a part down, you can give it a name, length, and a width, uh, what tool you want to use for the border, and then um, select a work order that you want to place it onto or draw it out onto the screen. Um, the routing tools, everything else is the same, so you can still add additional routes onto this nest pattern and update the G code. Um, so that's pretty nice. So that's all I'm going to show you in the processing station. I just want to also now show you um, that same interface just with a um, using the, the part properties or dropping a part into 2D. Because previously we'd have to know what part um, we'd drop down into 2D. So now I know that, yeah, that's the left side. I know that, but if um, sometimes if you've got a list of parts in a product that might have, you know, 50 parts in there, it's difficult to go and find the name and, and line it up and it just says base right side row five. If it's just called part, 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 you've got to go and count the rows. We don't have to do that anymore. So now if whatever I do, if I want to add some machining, um, you know, draw a polyline and add a route or, or whatever um, onto that, I can you know, draw those lines, go to my routing tools, everything's the same. The other thing you'll notice is we've now got a box up here that says only show tools with default depths. So with that selected, in your tool file, you would have known um, previously that if you didn't have a tool for default tool in your uh, depth in your material, uh, in your tool file, say for example, your skimming tool, which we typically set up with no default depth, so it doesn't show in this box. Now we've got the ability to untick that and still see those tools. So you don't have to go back to your tool file, add a default depth, come in here and then apply the machining. So that's a, a handy little function. By showing tools, with, uh, by ticking that box, it just condenses the, the list. Um, so everything else is the same. I can pick the center right or anything on that. Um, but now to update, all I need to do is just right click and say update part and redraw the product and it will do it. I don't have to go and right, find the part in the list and right click it and say update that part. Um, my box uh, two, two door 2D editing tools can remain open as well and drop additional parts down and just keep working on them. So it's really fast to, um, to manipulate and add, add machining when required. So that's, um, that's pretty much without going through the library. I might just show you one more thing that we've done in here just in case you haven't seen um, our new library with the, and the way that we handle our shadow line finger pulls. Um, so we've now got the shadow line finger pulls here. I can control whether I have a shadow line at the top or not. Um, and now I've got the ability to have different extrusions, um, different solid rails or solid rail with a batten. Um, so whichever one I select in there will, will do that. 
The other thing with our drawer box cabinets, um, most of them now we can add inner drawers. So I might want to add an inner drawer to the bottom of that product. And I might change that to say a Blum Legra box and say, okay, let's make that cabinet a little wider than 450. Uh, I'll make it 900 wide so we can see the next part of this. So the other thing what we've done is we've, um, we can do cutouts in our drawers now. So by using the subassembly prompts button here, I can come into that subassembly and I can select, say I might want to make it a C height and I want to do a rear cutout. So I tick the box and then I've got my cutout options. I can make a cutout, say 200 by 200. And I can change anything on that to a different runner length or fixing pattern or whatever you want on that with the BSE, with the um, Blum. And also, just before I click out of here, you'll see down the bottom the save options. If I just say save this subassembly only, it's only working on that top subassembly. I can also choose in that drop down for the whole product and it would have put that same cutout through all of the drawers. Okay. And then I could also put a cutout in the back of that cabinet, um, a three-sided notch in that cabinet and make it go around a column. So I could still have a draw box going around a column at the few clicks of a button. So that's um, in our current 17.3 library. Now, if you have a 17.1 library and above, um, it's uh, pretty much a library patch that we can send you out and it'll give you most of this functionality. So I'm going to hand it over to Clay and see if he's got any questions there for me on what I've just shown you before we um, hand over to Tim to show us some more tools. Yeah, I think uh, I think that was a great uh, demonstration there of some of the new things that we have in the library. And I, there may there's not a lot of questions coming in right now. I think we got them mostly answered, but um, there are some things I think we should probably highlight for those who are listening in. Um, so do we need the latest, uh, one of the questions I have here is, do we need the latest library and update to be able to use these tools that you've shown today? I know you've gone covered a lot in the library itself and then some in the, you know, the program. And so I just want to make sure that we're clear on, on what we have there in that update. Yeah. So yeah, to cover that, um, Clay, that's a good question. I might not have been too clear on that, but with the 15.5 build is going to give us all of the functionality of the user interface that I've shown you. Um, the library is, is uh, um, the, the things I did on the library with the reports and showing you the, the 2D um, drawing of the, of the cabinet that I've got up on the screen there. That um, is, part of the library so you would need to have the new 15 17.3 uh, library um, for that and like I was saying if you are running a an older library it would probably be best for us to start you off with a brand new configuration so you would start from fresh we would wipe out your database you'd keep your old jobs and everything there as a different configuration so that when you open you'd switch and be able to switch backwards and forwards um, but to have this functionality would be a new installation of the library. So the library is free, so anybody can have the library. We can send you out the links. If you email us, we'll send you the link to the library. Um, we will have a, uh, an install link um, for that sometime in the new year, uh, once um, Lenny can configure that for us in the US. Um, but at this stage, it is just a, a Dropbox link that you can um, grab all those files and create your own configuration. And, and start using it. So the only thing you will need to do is you'll need to export your processing um, stations out of your old configuration, bring those in, um, export your library out and bring that in, um, and then just change any of your, your settings that you want in your globals um, to, to what we've got uh, from, from standard. So um, it's pretty easy to do. If, if anybody um, wants us to help them do that, it's just a service. So we typically um, would take to configure a new library with you, um, letting us know we go through your global and take a photo of each page in your global and try and set up the, the new globals exactly as you are now and put all your processing stations in there. It typically takes about three hours um, to do that. So if you do need a hand with that, um, we'd be happy to, to send out a, um, a quote for the three hours or it may be less. It just depends on the configuration in your setup. Um, to do that, but um, anybody that wants to do it themselves, it's all free, it's all ready to go. So um, yeah, send me an email, we'll send you some links. Awesome. 
Yeah, I think you all also in that explanation, the next question I was going to get to is had to do with custom products. And if people upgrade to this, uh, this new library and they've, you know, taken the time to build custom products in their own data, the, okay. you know, maybe we should talk about a little bit more on the, the process that they would go through to use or to keep those custom products. Yeah, so um, within Microvellum now, we have some pretty cool new tools for doing that. So the customer um, or any of any of you guys listening here can use the, the new utility for doing that. So in our database utilities, we have these things called other utilities and you can export library items. So what you can do there, you can go into your old data set, uh, you can select that um, and you can go through and choose from your, so whatever your library is, uh, you can choose what products that you want to bring through. So you might have, typically, we ask customers when they are creating new products to give them their own name and put them in your own unique folder for your company so that it makes this process easier. If you've gone and overwritten our base cabinets and your one door base is completely different to ours, then um, that's not going to be really cut the mustard. You would need to rename that product um, and, and then once you've done that, you can then export it. So if I wanted to export all of my um, sync cabinets out, I can just tick the box and it will take all of those out of the data set, or I can go in and individually just select the cabinets that I want. And you can do the same for sub assemblies as well. And you can create your own small library patch that you can bring into your data set, um, into the new data set. So if, for example, you'd start with our new one, our 17.3, and then just bring your your catalog of your own products straight into that and they will work just fine. The globals haven't changed, we've only added to them, we haven't taken them away. So unless unless you're the, the, the sort of company that has gone in and created a whole bunch of new globals, then um, you are going to need a little bit of a hand from us unless you're pretty savvy and know how to bring a new global into your, your data or bring your old global in, but then it requires having a a legacy um, specification group so that your old cabinets would work. Okay, mm -hmm. so that's the, that's the process. Uh, it's pretty simple, doesn't take us too long. And again, once you've seen us do it once, you should be quite comfortable with doing it yourself from then on. Um, so I'm gonna crash out of that. Um, but yeah, any, yeah. any th there is another way we can do it using the Explorer and dragging cabinets in and out through a spreadsheet, but that we're finding this tool is much, much quicker. Mm -hmm, definitely. And so um, let's see, what about, we talked about products, but what about projects themselves, maybe projects that are um, using the old library, you know, what happens to those when we upgrade? Maybe we should talk about that a little bit too. Yeah, so the new, your, your old projects, if you're wanting to use them in the new data set, you could bring those in um, without, just by exporting the project and bringing them through, that they should work quite, you know, fine. Um, you might just need to, uh, watch when you are um, reprocessing that all of those cabinets are remained the same as the old one, but it will bring through their own copy. But if you're going to go and draw a new one or base into that, it will be using the new library, not your old one. So, mm -hmm. yep. Yep. Good point. All right. Well, I think we, uh, we've covered quite a bit of information there on this part. I think it's really great. Um, one last thing, I think, what are you, are you using 2018? Looks like you are. Yeah. 2018. 2018. Yep. Uh, yep. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's good. So that's not also a requirement of anything that we've really shown off here today. We support the, the last three versions there. So 2018, 17 and 16 there. So that's correct. Yep. Okay. But anybody that's on the, um, on the OEM subscription, which is most, most companies now um, that are on support are on an OEM subscription. If they've, um, if you're not, we can let you know if you, if you've, Pretty much if you haven't been on um, a subscription or since 2016, you may not be. So you might be sitting on an old AutoCAD, then we might need to look at upgrading your AutoCAD to 2018 and then putting you on the OEM subscription, which allows you to then um, have, a, uh, have access to the new AutoCAD as it's released. So anybody running 2017 AutoCAD will have access to the 2018 AutoCAD. It is just an installation. Um, there's not much difference between the two. If you're on 2016, um, probably early next year is probably the time to jump up to 2018. Um, it is, uh, like I say, it's not much different, um, mm -hmm. but um, it just means that we're on the latest and you've already paid for it. So you might as well have it. Right. Yeah, I think in this 2018, the stability improvements, I think some of those were some of the, the hottest features there. We covered that in a couple of live events ago. So, and you didn't, did you have to make many changes there to your drawing template? 
Uh, no, didn't have to make any changes to the drawing template. Um, the only thing we did add, we added um, some of these um, 2D plan tokens into the layers, um, mm -hmm. but it's not necessarily a requirement either. It will automatically put them in there as you draw it, but um, we can also, if we if, if you get the new data set, they will already be in there. If you're using an old drawing template, um, it might, again, just within that three hours, we can just go and tweak those and add any new layers in that you need. Right. Sounds good. Sounds easy enough. All right. Well, thanks again, Matt, for uh, taking the time to join us and uh, get this information across here to those uh, listening in. I think that was a really, really good uh, demonstration there. Great. No problem at all. And I'll hand it over to Tim to uh, take the reins and show us some of the new cool tools that we've got available. Yeah. So Tim, uh, thanks for joining us. He's going to help us out, as Matt mentioned there, with a tour of some of the solid modeling tools. How's it going this morning, Tim? Oh, good. Thank you, Colleen. Good, thank you. How about yourself? Uh, enjoying the evening over here in the in the States. Uh, Hopefully you're not too lonely in the office over there. No, I, I see a few lights on in the office, so I think we're, I think we're still good over here. Yeah, so, good stuff. Yeah, we featured the solid modeling tools quite a bit on our live events. I mean, it's one of the hottest features that we have, hottest new things that we have going on the toolbox side of things. Uh, and we've had some lead developers, you know, help out with some of the deep dives recently. But it's always good to see others using the tool and how, how they've uh, adapted it and are using it. So I'm looking forward to seeing what you've got here. Uh, but before we maybe get into that, I'd like to just let me launch this poll, quick poll. I want to see how many people here are actually using this and how, how deep they're into it. So I'm going to launch a quick poll. You should see that pop up on your side right now. So if you can just click a click a, an option there and then let us know what, you, what you're doing there uh, while Tim is uh, getting into this, um, it'll help us understand who's here today and what, what you have or what you've been using. Cool. Thank, thank you, Claire. All right. Um, so what, one thing we did recently, guys, is we added this um, solid model analyzer button here. So what we've done for customers, uh, premium customers that are running 2018, 17, and 16, this has been added into your software key automatically, I believe, is a value add. Okay, so all, all of you guys running the 15.5 builds should have access to this functionality um, that I'm showing you here at no additional cost. Um, so what we're going to do first is I'm just going to start off by drawing polyline and just showing a bit of a workflow here. So what we're going to do is make up um, just an L-shaped sort of office workstation desk. Just going to close off that polyline there. So if I come um, just down here and I get my chamfer, and we set that to be 300. Just going to click these two edges, and I'm just going to get a fillet tool, and we set to a radius of 100. If I just key in P for a polyline, it's going to do it to all those edges. So basically what I've done here, guys, is I've got a 2D, um, just a flat 2D sort of drawing of what I want to um, produce for a workstation top. We might just put a cable hole. Well, that's a little big cable hole in here. Um, so we set that to 50, not 500. So what I'm going to do, guys, is just come into a 3D Southwest view. Um, I'm going to type in a command, uh, AutoCAD command called uh, press pull. So if I just click in the middle here, and then I can extrude this up. Typically what I'd do here, guys, is just key in the thickness I want that. So we want that to be 18 mil. So what I have now is I've got an AutoCAD, not a microvolum, um, 3D solid here. So simply what we're going to do is come to our solid model analyzer. I'm going to click or window on what I want to analyze. I'll just give that a few minutes. Um, or few seconds it just depends on sort of what we're analyzing so you'll see that's moving along what it's done here is it's brought up the material thickness up here so I can literally just assign a material or create a new material from here so if we go okay I've got different options here depending on what I want to do so I can save it in the drawing save it in the project uh, save it in a different project or send it straight out to a work order here so I'm just going to draw this down um, in here, pick a point. So what you'll notice now is this is actually a microvillain product. It's not parametric as such, but you can see 
how quick and easy we can sort of manipulate this. So what I'm able to do now is interact this with this part like I would any other microvillain part. So draw part into 2D, sort of got this down. And here you can see all the machining. Um, simple little things like just coming in here and windowing over this, I'm able to stretch, stretch this part out. Okay, so it's a pretty cool workflow. Um, it's going to be pretty useful for a lot of your, you know, you guys that are custom manufacturers, just modeling um, stuff on the fly, converting it to a microvillain product. Still going to have to come into the part properties and put on things like edge tape and bits and pieces, but you know, it's going to do a lot of the work for you. So another sort of workflow, I'll just close this down, that I'll take you through. Um, so this is, I'm um, going to look at uh, some of our new builder technology. So this is for our um, enterprise customers. Um, and it's not, not available um, on the premium tier. Uh, but what we'll have a look at doing is look at our new um, product builder here. So if we go 1200, So again, just using the polyline. And we're just gonna close that off. So what I'm gonna do is just right click in here, now new um, solid modeling tab here. So I can give it a name. Okay, um, down on here, I've got different options here, depending on what I want to do. Um, for this example here, I want to do a custom product from the front. So in here, I've got color, so I can come in, choose a color, I can choose a material product depth. Um, I've got all my boundary joint options in here. So we can come down and choose all our joint options in here. Now we're going to be adding more on here, such as the mortise and tenon and the cams as time goes on. Um, so we're quite happy with all of this. I'm just going to hit OK. Other systems asking me just to select um, that border profile. I'm going to do that. I'm going to hit enter. I'm just going to choose where I want to put that. Okay, so if I just come into like a 3D view, and here you can see, let's just make that into a solid view here. So we can sort of see what we're looking at. Okay, so you'll see, yeah, we've got miters on here. There's options to turn on a back and all of that sort of stuff. Um, and this is where our custom tools come into play. Okay, so for example, here we've got all of our different joint options. Okay, so you see here, okay, we're mitered at the moment. So if I come here and choose my butt join, I'm able just to change that. And depending on um, what order you click them, it depends sort of, you know, where the butt is um, on there. So you see I've, I've done these two in different orders. So my join's facing down and on this one it's facing out. Um, working on all of our inserts and bits and pieces in here. Um, so we're able to drag in dividers and drawers, etc. Um, this this builder, this particular builder is really going to come come to life once our new hardware um, builder is built, which is basically going to allow us to download um, like a 3D D DWG, for example, from Blum or Hedic or whoever, and automatically scan and analyze that for holes, etc. So that's just sort of one workflow um, for cabinets, making a cabinet. Sort of another workflow that we might look at for the, our enterprise customers in here is just, um, let's just do something like this here. I might just make that a bit smaller. Okay, so let's do um, a workstation top here, similar to what I did, did before, just a different workflow. So I'm just going to trim out sort of what I don't want. I'm going to pretend, okay, these are my two tops. This is a round column. Okay, so I can come back to my tree view here. And I'm just going to come to my products and right click. So you can just keep building products in here. So we'll go product um, unit two. Doesn't really matter what we call that. What I'm going to do is come down here and go custom products data. And I'm just going to hit OK. So you'll notice that we've added a unit essentially, but we've got no parts in here. Whereas if I come into here, I can see all of those parts. 
um, that are in there. So if I um, right click and go add, I've got different options here. So I can click on this drop down part from like existing 3D solid, but what I'm gonna do here is part from boundary. Um, I can give it a color. And again, a material as well in here. So what I can do now is simply just click in between sort of in these boundaries here. So I can click in here and choose where I want to put that. Now we'll just give that a second guys and what that's going to do is analyze that and give us um, a part that we can basically machine and send straight to the CNC uh, very quickly. I don't know if we have too many questions coming in, guys, or Clay. Yeah, I do. There's, there's probably some things we should maybe cover. So we, in the beginning, we talked about uh, modeling and how you were able to create something from a simple 2D line. And so we've used mm -hmm. that a couple different times. So here's like a, who knows what that part is. Um, but it could be something of a bigger product. product. Um, and so you used AutoCAD to model that up. And we all know AutoCAD is fully capable of doing all sorts of things like that with for modeling. But w there, there's a lot of our customers and a lot of uh, people out there who are using Inventor and other mm -hmm. types of modeling tools. And so I want to just make sure we're, we're clear on we're not just be you know focusing only in AutoCAD. Um, we're mm -hmm. able to import in from other software as long as it's in a DWG format uh, and 3D solids. Uh, that's going to allow flexibility to basically expose uh, this option as a somebody who's maybe receiving drawings or, or designs from architects or other people who, you know, you don't want to have to reinvent the wheel. And so that's where this solid modeling analyzer tool comes in, in terms of the ability to just analyze those parts. Yes, um, yes, so. that, that's correct. Yeah, another, uh, I, go ahead. I was saying a lot of our um, sort of customers do get files from their designers or architects and, you know, scan them and yeah, send them straight out to the machine. Mm -hmm. Another use case for this too, we've done it a couple times here, or had the request or uh, ability to show, showcase it is architectural plans come in and there's some kind of custom countertop, whatever that's specced out. And so instead of trying to redraw that again and getting all your arcs exactly right, you can just simply copy those lines and use press pull or extrusion tools to uh, create the thickness and create your parts. So it's really, really quick and easy. Yeah, yeah, that's, uh, I mean, the thing is, is with these tools and with all of the tools in Microvolume, there's just so many different workflows. So this is just another tool, yep. you know, that you've got. You might, you might only use this particular sort of workflow with a solid model tool here on sort of one area of your job and your normal library cabinets on the rest. Mm -hmm. um, it's just a matter of sort of looking at the job and working out the best workflow for what you're doing. Right. Yeah. Yeah, and so you did cover it as well too that the solid modeling analyzer tool as you see it there that with that button has the ability to or is available in um, for customers in the premium tier and that is uh, something new it used to only exist in the enterprise level and so we bumped that down uh, to expose the benefits of that it's a great tool um, but it also does exist in the solid modeling tools as well you saw Tim there when he went in to add a part he could have uh, chose existing solids if he would have chosen that one it does give you a little bit more advantage because it actually lists all the parts out so that it works a little bit differently but um, it's the solid model analyzer as was previously showed was you know is, is very very powerful as well it's just this provides a little bit more fun functionality for listing out all the individual parts and seeing everything there mm -hmm. so oh, very good so it looks like we have a question that was from YouTube uh, that came in and it says can you uh, can you scan the architect plans or do you need to get the DWG file from them well it depends uh, do you want to take that one or do you want me to answer that Tim oh you, you can click on that. okay perfect so yeah so yeah you can get a DWG file from them if you wanted to uh, that obviously work the, that's the best case uh, in every every instance I think uh, sometimes you get drawings from architects and there's lines that aren't necessarily connected so there's a little bit of inspection that has to be done to make sure that it's right and we do have a, an algorithm that goes through and tries to clean up some things but uh, I've, I've got several samples from architects where it's like you know how did you even draw this it's it's not even <laughs> at the at the you know fine details it's not even connected so you have to make some change uh, modifications there but but for the most part yeah that's the best case to get those dwg files there are other ways in autocad where you can import a pdf file and then just trace over it if you wanted to uh, that sometimes works but it's not as exact so anyways i hope that uh, answers your question there uh, i'm not sure how to pronounce your name there on on youtube but i uh, hope that hope that answers your question 
uh, let's see, there were some other things here too. I took some notes as you were going through. Um, what's the magic behind the, the uh, tool ass assignments? Because that's, that's an awesome feature. Uh, you saw Tim there as he went through this, there's no, he didn't have to assign what tool path, he didn't have to choose the compensation, he didn't have to do anything in terms of, of choosing or, or having the software even know that it should have used a router as opposed to a you know, gigantic drill bit to, to uh, create that machining. So I think that would be a good area to talk about too. Yeah, yeah, for sure. One, one improvement that we made in the 15.5 release is we've actually allowed um, sort of more control over all of the tooling you'll notice down here we've got like default um, cutting tools and directions, uh, divider routing tool example. So if I wanted my default divider routing tool to be um, this guy here, I'd li literally just tick it and hit apply. So yeah, that, that's sort of updated that, you know, so if we were using sort of some of our wall building technology, et cetera, that would automatically um, be looking at that for us. Um, another area, um, of control as we come to our solids tab here. Um, we can adjust material thicknesses, minimum, maximums, part sizes, etc., hole diameters, mm -hmm. um, curved parts, um, even the layers. If, if you're drawing on the correct layers, it can automatically assign different materials, um, etc. So that's how we're getting a lot of the control. So yeah, this, these, go ahead. Sorry. I was just saying these sort of tools, guys, kind of do sort of 80 to 90 percent of the work a lot of the time you're still sort of okay i'm going to come into the part properties i'm going to adjust this i'm going to put edge tape on here i might slightly tweak this or draw this part down into 2d mm -hmm. um again just like i mentioned before it's just one of the many tools that we've got and just combining workflows as well can give you really quick and efficient results yep and, and there's a, you know, going back to the poll that we launched earlier, earlier there's quite a bit of people here who are still exploring these benefits and uh, trying to understand them. So um, just a, just one other point I think we should clarify too. This is a fairly simple, well, obviously really simple uh, little part here that we've made, but there are things that we've gotten as far as, you know, when we were testing this or from samples from customers saying, hey, can I do this? Can I build that? Is this something that would work? Some really complicated things. And some of these things, uh, you know, are made up of more than just parts, you know, more than just something that you would put on a flat table router or something like that. So we have, you know, hinges, we have hardware, we have leg levelers, we have other things that in, are in this model. And so one of the nice things about this is that we have the ability to, uh, to be smart about it. And so we're not going to try to optimize or nest a leg leveler because we're going to know that's not going to fit into the parameters. So the, the system or the tool is very smart in terms of understanding what it qualifies to even be considered for something that we're going to actually manufacture. And so we will analyze it and we will show that they're in the model when you make a micro product out of it, uh, just so that, uh, you know, it's apples to apples. You, when you, after you analyze it, you can see that it's the exact same thing, but we do have ways of indicating whether or not a part will actually make it through to a nest or into manufacturing. So that's something that we should also understand as well. Let's see here. Sure, thank you, Clay. I'm not sure if yep. there's any um, more questions. Yeah, there is another question that came in. I was just trying to get my head around the, qu uh, the question here. So I see Andrew had a question, um, point to point for lead-ins, et cetera, and feed speeds. Um, in regards to that, it's gonna sort of use, I guess your default um, feed speeds, et cetera, for your minimum you know, for, you, for your tooling. So if you wanted to adjust that, you'd need to sort of adjust that to suit. Yep, that's right. And so, yeah, this was that feature that uh, that Tim showed off there. That was a fairly new uh, thing. In the beginning, when we first released this, we were just making assumptions and doing it for the user. Uh, and that was good for the most part. And then we had people saying that, well, we want a little bit more flexibility. And so then we exposed that ability. So yeah, you have that flexibility now to be able to assign the specific things that you want there. Mm -hmm. uh, let's see, Matthew is asking, at this point, can you go into the product properties and add some assemblies like uh, on an older build? So I'm, I think that what you're asking is if after you have a product 
like Tim is showing there, and I think he's going to go ahead and do it for you. Yeah, that is a fully functional microvellum product that, you know, if this was more than just a sample part, a simple little side of something, it was an actual product, well then, yeah, you can even go in and add parametric uh, properties to this to make it fully functional to add something even to your library. But I'll let you go through that, Tim. I don't know if I covered that well enough. Yeah, no, that, that's it. Uh, once it's analyzed, uh, Matthew, it's a full um, microvellum product, so yeah, you can draw parts down into 2D, um, apply edge tape, etc. Um, again, this is something very simple, but it doesn't matter sort of how big it is or whatnot. And we've sort of greatly um, improved in the 15.5, um, like all our analyzing technology and all the speed um, that it's sort of doing a lot of this. You know, we've had sort of great feedback from our customers uh, about things that used to take sort of, you know, 10 or 20 minutes now taking one or two minutes. So, mm -hmm. yeah, and, and that's that's good, you know, we're working closely with AutoCAD on this to sort of refine the technology, but this sort of technology um, that we're doing is, is sort of very unique and um, to micro and very sort of exciting. Yep, uh, let's see, there was one other thing that I felt that maybe needed a little bit more, even if we just explain it, I think that would be good because of the fact that people are still trying to cons understand the benefits of these uh, solid modeling tools. And that has to do, we have three tabs, we covered two. Uh, and so we have a tree view that lists all the products that we have, whether it's a custom product or an extruded product. And so you saw Tim here go through the process of creating, uh, you know, a couple different things using these tools, uh, created kind of a custom little cabinet, maybe a shelf of some kind. And then he even created maybe what might be a part of a bench top or a workstation that he was making. Uh, and those tools work out really well. And you saw that he was able to just use that simple AutoCAD geometry, which is you know, dumb lines, as we say, there's no intelligence behind it. And that's totally different when we start talking about our extruded tools. Uh, I don't know if we have much time. We're already kind of over time by five minutes. Um, but yeah, so the extruded tools works a little bit differently. And if you have not seen that uh, in action, there's a lot of videos online uh, that show on our YouTube channel, on our, on our website, show how that, show how that works. Um, and we'll be releasing probably about an hour and a half long training video on how to use that tool as well. But again, that is a very, very powerful tool for building things like die walls, nurses stations, reception areas, things like that. So a uh, very powerful tool if you have not uh, experienced that and would like a demonstration, I'm sure Matt or Tim would be happy to help you out with that. But again, that is a tool. If you work with architects and you build those types of products, you must check that out because it's going to save you valuable time for sure. All right, anything else? I think that about covers the cloud. I'll pass okay. it back to you now. That's awesome. Let me make sure. I think we got all the questions answered. Got that one and we got that one. All right, yeah, so I think we got all those questions answered. And as we mentioned there in the beginning of the webcast today, uh, we will have um, more events for the Australian market, so we, or for the Australian and New Zealand time zone. So we definitely look, look forward for you to return to these events and uh, that'll about do it for today i appreciate you staying with us after the, the hour here it's an hour and seven minutes and so we uh, would like to again yeah, thank you for attending today and we look forward to seeing you on our next microbelm live event